Great. Well, hello, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Emily Somerville. I am part of OITE, uh, Program Manager for the Office of Postdoctoral Services, um, but I am here today to talk to you about posters. What does a good scientific poster look like? How do you present them? Um, and in my time in science, I have presented a lot of posters. Um, it becomes sort of your bread and butter of communicating your science to other scientists. Um, and you'll be doing a lot of these throughout your career. Um, I know a lot of you are probably preparing for post-bac poster day in May. Um, and if this is your first poster, congratulations, it's gonna be fun. Um, and I can guarantee you it will not be your last poster. There will be a lot more after this. Uh, but I have experience not just from presenting posters, but also judging posters. So I've been judged at various posters for you know, post-bac peer, grad student peer at NIH. Um, while I was a grad student, um, I would judge posters for other events at my grad institute, um, other occasions like that. So I can tell you both what a poster should look like from someone presenting it, as well as someone who's looking from the other side. Uh, so what does a poster session look like? What is a poster session? Um, for those of you here in person and online as well, you can chime in in the chat. How many of you have attended a poster session either at like a symposium or some sort of scientific meeting in person? Oh, good, yes, perfect. We know some people are still catching up post-pandemic. A lot of poster sessions went fully virtual for a couple of years. Um, and it's just now getting to the point that everyone is starting to see what poster presentations look like in person again, um, which feels very different than online. I personally love in-person poster days. It looks kind of like this. Um, these are po pictures from OITE poster events that we've done. Um, I think one of them is a post-bac poster day and one of them is a grad student research poster day. Um, but you'll see it's just people mingling around with these large boards with big posters of them presenting their work. Um, and it's a time to really converse with other scientists, to sit down and talk with them about what you do um, and try to get feedback from other people in the audience. So why present a poster? Why do we go through this whole uh, process of creating this giant piece of paper that you're only going to use once and never see again? Um, why do we do a poster? It really allows you to share your findings with other scientists um, and sometimes the general public. Sometimes there's not even a uh, special scientist at that poster session. Um, but it really gives you a chance to learn how to communicate what you do. Um, and the way the posters are set up, it's often an event where people are wandering through a big hall of other posters. There's a lot to look at. So the interactions you have with people are very short. And it's learning how to communicate your science in just a few minutes to someone. Um, that's really the goal of the poster session here. Um, it, you also develop your verbal communication skills. So a poster, even though it's printed, that's not the whole part of the poster presentation. You have the whole presentation aspect in there too. You need to know how to talk about your science at your poster and present it in a way that catches people's attention and also gets your message across. Um, poster sessions are also great for getting feedback from other people. This is uh, especially true for projects that you're presenting that are still in progress. Almost all of the time, the work that you show in your poster presentation, it's not going to be like your finished, published product. These are projects that you're still working on. Um, and so this is a great time to ask people questions about, oh, would you do this method this way? Oh, what about trying this experiment next? Um, and people are always happy to give you feedback on what you could try next. Um, poster sessions are also great for networking and meeting other people. I have on multiple times met other people at poster sessions, at conferences who um, wanted to talk to me later about like either collaborating on my project. Um, I even got an invitation for a postdoc job interview after a poster session once. So like finding other jobs and other people to collaborate with absolutely happens at poster sessions. Um, it's a great time to meet people in person. So we talked a bit about the poster session. What goes into your actual poster? What a poster should be is a concise, visually, visually pleasing, uh, it's an illustration of your research. Um, it's a snapshot in time of everything that you do and telling people what you do, um, not just what you did, but how you did it and why they should care about that project. Um, and this is a really big one too, is it's not just the nitty gritty details of your project. You want to tell a story on this piece of paper and tell people why they should care about this research story um, and what does it contribute that's new to science. So here's an example of a poster. Um, you don't have to worry about reading all the little details because I just want to show the picture of it. This is one of my posters from when I was in grad school. Um, so I did a lot of posters back then. Um, you'll see there's a lot of stuff on here. And I'll talk about this later, about now that I know more about designing posters, there are a few things I would change about this poster. 
Uh, but this is probably pretty typical to what you'll see in big poster halls at scientific meetings is just a lot of these all lined up next to each other. So you're designing your own poster. Um, raise your hand if you are planning on presenting at Postback Poster Day. Let's see how many in the room. Fantastic. Almost everyone in person. Online as well, feel free to raise your hands. Oh yeah, left online. Um, the number one thing when designing your own poster, read the directions. It is such a small thing, but it is so important to make sure you follow the directions for whatever scientific meeting or symposium you're presenting at tells you to do for your poster, because oftentimes they will have slightly different requirements than other places. Um, so one example, in the United States, the most common format for poster presentations is horizontal. The sort of standard size is 48 inches wide, 38, 6 inches high. Um, however, in Europe, that's flipped. So in a lot of European meetings, if you go over there, their posters are vertical. Um, so pay attention to what the meeting tells you in terms of printing out the poster. It's also important if there's uh, a particular size of the board that your poster has to go on to, because you don't want a poster that's too big that it physically can't fit on their board. Um, also find out before the event how you'll be able to uh, like actually tack up your poster to the poster board. Um, most meetings will provide uh, push pins for post back poster day we do. So we'll have just a bucket full of push pins that you can use to put your poster up. Um, but when traveling to other scientific meetings in your career, I always bring just a little bag of extra push pins with me. Um, maybe some uh, scotch tape, masking tape, something just in case there's a tear in the poster or something else. Um, so bringing some extra office supplies is not a bad idea. Um, also make sure at big poster sessions that you know the time of your presentation. This is often because there are more poster presenters than there are physical space for them. And so there are shifts of people presenting posters. This will be true for Postback Poster Day. There are over a thousand people who will be presenting posters and we do not have the physical space to get 1,000 posters up all at the same time. Um, so just make sure you pay attention to what day and what time your poster goes up in place and what time you need to take it down to the next presenter after you. So what should you do with your poster? What is the goal of this? Uh, like I mentioned, it's really a chance to communicate what you do in a short period of time. So you need your message to be clear, emphasizing the clarity of the content here. You don't want to spend the entire time telling them about everything you've done for the past year or two years. You want to tell a, like a complete story, um, which sometimes means leaving out details. You do not have to tell them about every experiment you've done over the past two years. Um, you don't have to tell them about every part of the project, especially if you're working on like multiple sort of like smaller components to fit into a bigger story. Sometimes it's better to pick a smaller story overall that you can walk through completely in a poster than trying to talk about everything all at once. Um, at the same time, you also need to give enough content that people who aren't an expert in your field can understand what you're talking about on your poster. Um, fun fact, all of you are now experts in what you do. You may not feel like it. There may be days that you doubt it, but trust me, the fact that you are here doing research at NIH, you are an expert in the topic that you work on every day. Um, and the people you talk to at your poster, the vast, vast majority of them, you're going to know more about that topic than they are, um, especially true at NIH poster presentations, because we have scientists who are experts in all sorts of different biomedical backgrounds, but the people at your poster may not be from your background. So my background is in cancer cell biology. Um, if I walk up to a neuroscience poster, bless you, all of you in neuroscience, brains are hard. I will not be able to follow along with the biology of what's happening in that poster unless you back it up and simplify it a lot for me. Um, and the same thing is true for most people at your poster. They'll be an expert in something, but probably not what you talk about. Um, so you need to make sure that they're comfortable understanding what's in your poster. Uh, it's also important for posters to be visually appealing. Uh, it's not a thing you really think about, but you're really selling your science. There's sort of like a marketing aspect to this. So you want your poster to look visually appealing. You look at it and you're like, oh, that's kind of a cool project. Um, and it's not overwhelming. You don't throw too much information at people all at once. Um, and if it's a good looking poster, people are more likely to stop you know, if you scan it for five, 10 seconds, look at it and decide if they want to stop and stay longer and read the full poster. So most people are making pretty quick judgments on it. And if it's visually appealing, you're more likely to get audience members to stop by and actually read your poster or talk to you about it. Another super important thing for poster presentations is know your audience. There's a big difference in how you talk about science in your lab meetings week to week with people who are experts on your topic 
You can throw around different acronyms and jargon left and right, and you all know what you're talking about. You're fluent in the nitty-gritty details of your project um, versus talking to someone who's not in your field versus, say, explaining your project to your grandmother. Um, each of those different levels of talking about your science, you have to present the science in a different way. Um, and it's important to know who you're talking to. Um, so one of my favorite tips here is when someone comes up to talk to you about your poster, especially poster judges, it is A-OK -okay and, in fact, encouraged to ask them, what is your scientific background? And it feels weird to be asking a judge a question. But if you just ask them, what is your scientific background? What do you study? They'll tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, so if I had a judge come up and say, oh, I'm also in cancer biology, I'll be like, great, cool. You know the basics of these concepts. I can move on to more details. Or if someone's like, oh, I work in, uh, you know, immunology and in, in inflammation responses. I'll be like, all right, cool. So you don't know the cancer biology background here necessarily. Let me explain a little more backstory before getting into my data. Um, so yeah, ask your, your audience what is their background, and they'll tell you, and then you can decide how much detail to go into based on that. So again, how would you present your research to a scientist in your same scientific area versus, say, a middle school classroom or your grandmother? These will look very, very different. Um, also ask yourself, are there any terms or acronyms on your poster that you need to spell out? Um, acronyms especially. It is very easy to use acronyms all the time um, in science about remembering that not everyone knows what an acronym means. So at least the very first time you use it, spell it out. Um, but because posters are so short in the amount of time that you see people, try to just spell out acronyms as much as you can. Um, don't rely on them throughout the whole poster, um, unless it's something incredibly common. Like DNA, you can keep that as DNA. Uh, but things that get more complicated, it's best to spell out the acronym where you can. Um, and remember, again, what information do you want people to take home with them? There's going to be a lot of information on the poster, um, but anyone walking by your poster is not going to absorb all of it. You need to make sure they can find that big picture uh, take-home message from your poster. What is your big conclusion? Can they remember that easily? So one example here of how to keep your audience in mind. Um, this is the same poster I showed earlier, so one of my posters from grad school. Um, this is a poster I presented at a few different like national scientific conferences. I presented at you know department seminars while I was in grad school. Um, and I won poster awards for this. So like this poster did very, very well. But it was all aimed at people in the cell biology community and who were experts on it. Flip that, I took the same project and presented it to a uh, middle school science outreach event um, called the Flip Science Fair, where the scientists are presenting their work to the middle schoolers and they are judging us. So in order to do well in this competition, you had to have the middle schoolers understand what you're talking about. So I took the same project and simplified it down into a poster for this middle school audience. Um, so I changed the title. It's much more big picture. I took out a lot of data. I kept it a lot simpler. Took out a lot of the words and the legends because they're not going to be reading the bigger legends here. Um, and I added more background information on like, what is DNA methylation? I can guarantee you've not heard of this. Let's talk about it. Um, so really simplifying the concepts for the audience. So what does a typical poster look like? Uh, this is a pretty standard layout for uh, a poster. We scientists are creatures of habit. We're used to seeing the same patterns over and over when we go to a poster. So it's best to stick with sort of the usual outline of what the shape of a poster should look like. So the title and just affiliation, what authors, uh, where they're from, are always at the very top on that top bar there. And then you'll often see three or four columns in the middle. Um, and since we are in an English-speaking country, people expect to read from left to right, top to bottom. So your figures need to follow in that order as well. So always start in the top left corner of the column, work all the way down that column. The next section, go to the middle column, go from the top down. Then the right column, top down. Um, this is just sort of the standard order that scientists expect to see data in on a poster. If you try to flip it around and get creative with the placement, people may get lost trying to find what you're trying to tell them. Um, oh, another important point here, make sure you keep empty space. In this example here, there are white borders around all of the different chunks. That is on purpose. You need to include white space so that the poster does not look like it is overwhelmingly crowded with information on it. Um, I'll give you numbers in here a little bit later, too, but it's a shocking like, percentage of the poster that should be just purely blank space. It will look weird to design, I promise, but it will look really good once you print it because you'll be able to visually look at one section, move to the next, without it all getting cluttered up together. Uh, 
but I am going backwards instead of forwards. There we go. So parts of a poster. Um, this list of different parts of it, what does this list of parts look like? Where else do you see these combinations of headings? Scientific paper, exactly. This is the same set of stuff that you'll see in a scientific paper. What you put under those headings is going to be a little bit different for a poster, but it's the exact same stuff that you're used to reading and seeing every day in science. You always have your title explaining what your project is and trying to grab people's attention to come see it further. Um, authors and affiliations, so who did the work, giving them credit. Um, an introduction or hypothesis to your project, giving enough background information that people feel like they understand the big picture of it. Um, going a little bit into methods, this one is way less detailed than it is in a scientific paper. You want to be very simple with the methods on a poster. Um, talk about your results. This will be most of the space on the poster. Probably about half of it is just the results, showing the data that you got and what it means. Um, you'll have a final concluding section. This is another great space for like summary pictures are super helpful. Um, and then you can include an optional future direction section. I'll talk about that as well. I always recommend including one, but you don't have to have one on the poster. Um, one thing that's becoming more common as well, when you add uh, references to like citations to other papers or acknowledgements or your own contact information for people to find you later, it's becoming more and more common to just put that in a QR code at the bottom of the poster and they can find that supplemental information in the QR code. Um, you do not have to do that, fully optional, but that's a great way to share extra information that doesn't fit well on the poster quickly and easily with audience members. Um, and then one question that comes up all the time is, do I need an abstract on the poster? Honestly, it depends on the conference. Some conferences, some symposiums will require you to have an abstract on it. Other ones will not. Uh, Postback Poster Day does not require an abstract. Uh, most meetings, the abstracts are available online. So you don't have to keep up space on your poster and listen to the abstract. People can look it up in the online program and read it there. It's better to use that space for a short bullet point list than it is to include the entire abstract copy and pasted onto your poster. Um, so what goes into the poster itself? We talked about what is a poster, what does the structure look like, now what goes into those different parts. Um, the one important thing here before you start designing your poster is you need to have your PI's approval for what goes into the poster and the final poster product. This is important for a couple different reasons, uh, mostly that whenever you present research, you're presenting data that is not yet published, uh, meaning that there's always a risk of someone scooping your story, um, especially if there's anything that could become a patentable idea um, or anything that will be in a future publication. You need to clear it with your PI first to make sure that you're okay to share it publicly. Um, there are ways to talk about this with your PI as well. They'll have different strategies in their lab. Um, some PIs are more flexible with what is presented, some are not. Uh, but this is important, especially being at NIH, because your data does not belong to you. It does not belong to your lab. Your data belongs to NIH as a whole. Uh, so NIH is very like careful with making sure that we don't share stuff that could be um, used outside of NIH, essentially. Um, for like post back poster day, don't have to worry about like getting spooked in like other big problems. It's mainly national conferences where you can see that, but you still have to have your PX permission for what goes into your post there. Um, Again, you want to think about the big take-home message and make that very easy to find in your poster. So things like making your title, really giving a big conclusion statement of what is the take-home message. Having summary pictures in either your background introduction section or in your conclusion uh, so that people can visually find what is the big picture easily. Um, and then once you have the big picture set, then you can start adding in the smaller details of why you did what you did um, how you did it uh, and what it contributes that's new. But the why you did it statement, uh, for me being in cancer biology, the statement was always very easy. It's always cancer bad, just some variation of that, cancer bad. So talk about statistics of mortality uh, and incidents for the cancer type I'm working on. You know, talk about quality of life. There's a lot of like really easy facts to get at. Um, some of you are working in areas that are much more like directly linked to a human disease and disorder. That'll be very easy as well. Talk about the disease. Talk about why you should care about these patients. Some of you will be in more basic biology uh, where it may be a little bit harder to figure out how it connects to a disease. But I promise you all of your work relates back to human health in some way or another because you're here at NIH. So find that way. Uh, maybe you're studying a particular 
like gene and what it does. And like, if you silence this gene, how does that change the behavior of the cells? Um, talk about a couple of disorders where you may see mutations in the gene pop up. Um, even if it's just one disorder, that's enough for people to like find an idea to hang on to. Um, but they need some sort of tangible idea of why do I care about this project if this is not my specific research area. Um, and talk to people in your lab about this too, because they will also have tips on how they presented projects from the lab before um, and sort of given that big picture overview. The title. Honestly, this is the hardest part of making a poster is coming up with a good title. Um, it may seem silly, but like it is 100% honest. Coming up with a good title is so hard for me, and I know it is for so many others as well. A good title needs to be short. You don't want it rambling on forever, but it also needs to get your idea across. Um, and it needs to really like summarize the major finding that you had there. Um, yeah, this is a hard one. Again, talk to your lab mates. They will be able to sort of work out different ideas with you, brainstorm how to work it, but it should be a fairly succinct sentence sort of summarizing what your project is about or what you found. Um, do not contain major jargon or abbreviations in the title. As soon as someone sees a word they don't recognize in the title, they're going to lose interest um, from your poster and not want to come over and read it further. Uh, if they see like one really long acronym, you're like, oh, I have no idea what that is. That post is probably going to be too hard for me to understand. Move on to the next one. So don't scare people off. Make it easy for them to understand from just the title alone. Um, also important, make it really, really big. People need to be able to read this from six feet away. So I'll show you font sizes as well, but this is like 80-point font. It's going to look absolutely ridiculous on your laptop while you're designing it, but when you print it, you need it to be in huge font so people can see it from at least six feet away. So beneath the title, you have all of your authors and affiliations. So who did the work uh, and where are they from? Um, if you're presenting the poster, I'm assuming you will be a first author or co-first author if there's multiple people doing a poster together. Um, and then down from there is typically listed in reverse uh, like amount of contribution. So the person who did the most work is first, person who did the second most work is second, et cetera, et cetera. And then your PI is the very last person on that list. They're the senior author. Um, so it's sort of Descending from most works to least work, and then the PI at the very end, which feels weird, but that is how we do it in science in terms of ordering the author order. Um, also, talk to your PI about like who needs to be included on this. There's typically anyone who contributed uh, data or analysis uh, or something like substantial to the actual work in this poster. Um, you don't include people just because they're in your lab. They still have to contribute to the project that you are presenting. Um, so really, being a lab member does not get you authorship automatically. Um, you need to spell out any affiliations and abbreviations that are not commonly known. Uh, this is especially true for all of the NIH ICs, because we love a good acronym here at NIH, and nobody knows what any of the acronyms mean beyond NIH. Um, maybe like a couple of the bigger ones, like NCI, that's fairly recognizable, but even NCI, I would spell out National Cancer Institute. All of your ICs, I would do the same. Spell out the whole institute name so that people know what your institute is. Um, don't include sheet addresses. This used to be a thing that people did more way back when. Um, they would include the actual address with the affiliation. You don't need that. All you need is the institute name. Um, some places still include like city and state. That's fine. You can, not fully necessary, um, but you need the institute name for sure. Um, the list of names, the authors and affiliations is smaller than the actual title of the poster, but you still may be able to read it from a couple feet away. Um, often what I'll do is I will have title really big, the actual names of the authors and like a medium sized font, and then the affiliations of where you're from with superscript and a smaller font underneath that. Um, but yeah, you can play with it, see what looks best, but that's typically how I organize the top of the poster. Um, you can also add logos. Some people have added headshots. I would personally discourage you from using headshots. Um, it's really only useful if you're showing, you know, here's the whole research group, here's who else helps with the research. Um, but for the most part, it's just going to fill up space. Logos, however, are really useful for telling people where you're from quickly. So if they see like an NIH logo in the top corner, they'll be like, oh, cool, they're from NIH. I'm going to go talk to them. Um, they'll be able to tell just like where are you from quickly. There are uh, like free like vector logos available for NIH on the internet. You can find them, talk to your lab mates. They probably also have copies of it that they've downloaded for their own posters. Uh, but yeah, it's not a bad idea to just pick a logo in like the top left corner. 
So the introduction for your poster. This is really where you can start gaining the interest of people who stop to read your poster. So the first thing they go to after your title is the introduction and background. Um, so you need to convince them within this introduction section why they care about your project and why they should keep reading further into your poster or stop and ask you questions about it. So you have to give enough background information so that they are fit into like the context of your poster. Um, this is often where you'll justify the actual model system that you're using as well. This is true if you're using a lot of sort of non-standard model systems. Um, so talk about like why you did XYZ in Zebrafish or XYZ in Arabidopsis. People want to know like why you're using that system. Um, at the very end of your introduction, again, end with a big sort of summary statement of what are the goals, uh, the hypothesis of your project. Um, some people will put this hypothesis or goals in like a separate heading. I typically like to do that because it makes it stand out more in the poster. You have like intro background information and then your hypothesis and goals listed directly beneath it with their own heading that says that. And also pictures are your friends. So we'll repeat this over and over and over. Bullet points are great. Pictures are great. You do not want to overwhelm people with too much text. So minimizing the amount of words and maximizing pictures is a great thing to do on a poster. Methods. The methods themselves can be very brief. Uh, typically, when I include methods on a poster, I will make a summary schematic, um, often through BioRender. That's my favorite. BioRender is awesome. Um, make a summary figure. It's just walking through your method, but keep it very simple. Don't worry about like no antibody concentration, incubation time, all of those little details. If someone wants to know those details, it means that they're very like into your field. They're probably an expert in your field. They'll ask you those questions, and then you can talk about them one-on-one -on -one with that person. So the vast majority of people walking by your poster do not care about how long you incubated that antibody. So don't worry about including the tiny nitty-gritty details in the method summary. Um, this is more of a big picture spot. Once you get into your data, um, this is a little flexible in terms of how you present it, how much space it takes up. It'll vary from person to person because different projects have different amounts of data and have to be presented in different ways. Um, like I've seen some poster presentations where it's a lot of like single cell sequencing. And so there'll be like one big map right in the middle of like all of these single cells they're analyzing and then some other smaller boxes around it. Other people's posters are more sort of, I would say like traditional and that you'll have like a block of results here, a block of results here, a block of results here. And it just follows in like one block all the same size all the way down. This will just depend on what your data looks like. Um, but in general, uh, just have the key figures. You do not need to include every single piece of data on this poster because nobody has time to read everything that you put on there if you put an entire paper on the poster. Um, all of the figures should have a title that summarizes what's on them. This is super, super important. Um, so sort of like when you're presenting your research in a PowerPoint, the, it's the same concept where you want the slide title to summarize what you're talking about on that slide. Do that here, but for each of your figures. The title of each of the figures should summarize the findings in one sentence. Um, this is helpful so if people are skimming through quickly, they can find what the results mean and then spend more time looking at your data and looking to the details. Uh, but I always find it helpful to include that summary sentence telling them exactly what the figure should be telling them. And again, remember that people are reading this from a few feet away. The most common problem you'll see in posters when people put on figures is they're sizing the figures for reading them on a laptop. So the font is absolutely tiny. A 12-point font on your laptop is just fine for reading a PDF. If this is on a poster, you will have to get about four inches away from it trying to read like what the figure legend actually says. So whatever size font you think you need for your figure legends, for labeling your axes, make it bigger. I can promise you the font will need to be bigger for people to see it from a couple feet away. Um, oh, yeah, another point here. Uh, so... During poster sessions, there's often a time where you are not physically at your poster. So say like you set up an hour beforehand um, and then have time to wander around, get ready, but you're not physically at your poster. Um, ideally, your poster should be designed well enough that someone could stop and read it and get the idea of what you're talking about and it makes sense to them without you having to be there to walk them through the whole poster. Um, it's that careful balancing game of not too much information, but not too little information. Uh, and just making sure that if people stop by and look at your poster that they're comfortable sort of understanding the big picture of it 
Um, and if you're lucky and you get them excited about your posters, they'll come back and talk to you when you're physically there presenting your poster. The conclusion section. Again, bullet points are your friends. Keep the words brief. You don't want to overwhelm people with too many words. And this is another great place to have a bio render or similar uh, sort of rendering system to draw a model figure. Um, pictures really summarize ideas so much faster than a wall of text can. So other optional sections you can include. Uh, one is a future work section. I always like to include this, even if it's really brief. So this is the place where you put what comes next. What experiments are you going to try next? How does this extend into, say, a new model organism? They take it from cell culture into mice. Um, this is where you put those future projects. The interesting thing here is that the future projects don't have to be projects that you are planning yourself. This could be stuff that someone else in the lab is planning on doing. Especially true for all of you who are in your second or third year of a postdoc and are getting ready to leave and move on to your next exciting adventure. All of these future projects you're proposing, you won't be the person doing them. It'll be someone else in lab. But including just a couple ideas, even just two or three ideas of future projects shows that you've thought about this work and you know how it fits into the bigger context of what your lab does and what the field is really studying. Um, so it's always nice to include uh, just a couple different experiments that could be done next, even if you are not the one actually doing those experiments. Um, acknowledgements, there may sometimes be people that you need to acknowledge for their help, um, like core facilities, people who talk to you about your data but didn't like actually work on the experiments here, um, people who like, you know, help design the poster if they helped do that, uh, people who didn't contribute to the actual scientific part of it but helped you in some way along the way, um, funding sources, if you have like an extramural grant of some kind, um, if you become a grad student or a postdoc and have, say, like uh, an F award or K award, you would put that award information in your poster. Um, so extra funding sources always go in there as well. Um, this can be in a much smaller font than most of the rest of the poster because they don't need to read it from several feet away. Um, if people want to come read the acknowledgments, they can come get up closer and use those. Um, so don't worry about making the font super big on that. References, same thing. It's optional to include references to other papers, other citations. And if you do, you can make the fonts very small on that. Because again, people don't need to see it from a distance. Um, they can come up and read those if they want to. Or like I mentioned earlier, put all of that extra stuff in a QR code and they can scan it and then they'll have your list of references uh, and the acknowledgements to other people. Uh, you can absolutely do that as well. Just make sure to put a title above the QR code so they know what they're scanning. And once again, an important reminder that publishing data anywhere has intellectual property implications. So talk to your PI before you present your poster, before you print your poster. You should be talking to them before you actually like start making it and then again before you print it. Uh, so keep them in the loop. Just let, ask them like, hey, is it okay if I present XYZ project? Um, and they'll be able to get feedback as well on what a good poster looks like. Um, I absolutely recommend talking to you, not just your PI, but also other lab mates. Um, if there are grad students or postdocs or staff scientists in your lab who have presented posters before, have them just look at your poster and have them tell you uh, like what works and what doesn't work on the poster. Um, they'll have a lot of experience in what a poster structure should look like. So they'll be able to help you out in deciding how much to include or how much you need to trim out of your poster. So this is all about like what is in the poster, what information goes in there. Um, another important part of presenting a poster is it needs to be pretty. You need to have a visually appealing poster, otherwise people won't necessarily stop and talk to you. Um, what actually makes a well-designed poster is a lot simpler than you might think. This is great. Um, a lot of the information here is going to be keep your poster simple. You want the science to speak for itself. You want the layout to be simple. You want the fonts to be simple. You want everything on a grid just keeping it all nice and neat and organized so people can find the information that they're really excited to hear about. So going through some of these concepts. Um, planning ahead. This is one thing where you should do as I say and not as I do. Have I designed posters the night before a poster competition? Yes. Do I recommend that? Absolutely not. It is incredibly stressful, especially for big events where a lot of people are printing, like Postback Poster Day. There's going to be a thousand postbacks presenting even coming from a lot of our NH satellite campuses coming to Bethesda. 
Um, this means that there is a thousand people who need to print a poster for May 1st and May 2nd, and our printers at MAH cannot handle that volume. Um, I would recommend having your poster printed by at least a week before the event, so that way you know it is printed and you're done. Um, if you try to work up like close to the deadline like that, you run the risk of not being able to find a printer to physically print your poster. Um, so plan ahead. Work with your PI on this. Work with your lab mates on this. Um, take a couple weeks to really decide what goes into it. Um, one cool way of sort of deciding what goes where on the poster that I've seen people do, um, this is more in terms of deciding which data to include and which not to. Um, I've seen people basically print out just like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with part of one project. You're like, okay, this is what this figure roughly is going to look like. And do that with all of your bits of data. Just put them all out in the table and physically move them around until all of your data is in an order that looks good and makes sense to you. Um, so if you're a very like tactile person, that's a great way to plan this is just take the chunks of your data and just sort of arrange them in roughly a poster outline um, and then put it all together into the poster file. Actually making the poster file, the most common software to do this on is PowerPoint, which is great. There are a ton of free poster templates for scientific posters that you can do in PowerPoint. Um, if you want to get really fancy, you can do it in like Adobe InDesign, Adobe Photoshop. I don't recommend it because it's just a lot of work that you can just do in PowerPoint. Um, so look around for free poster templates. Again, your lab probably has templates that they've used and they like before as well. Um, while you're planning, this is also the time to simplify everything. So take your walls of text, trim them much shorter. Look for those words, those big jargon words, those acronyms that you're used to using that other people may not recognize and take that jargon and those acronyms out of the poster. Um, this is where having extra sets of eyes looking at your poster is really, really helpful. Um, even another post back who works in a different institute or a different lab, um, have them look at your poster and tell you what acronyms and words they don't recognize and then sort of change based on what other feedback you get from people. Um, designing things on a grid. This is referring to two different things. So both the fact that like you have standard columns, like three or four columns on your poster, everything is lined up in them. Um, and then also physically when you're designing your poster in PowerPoint, it helps put on this sort of like uh, shadow grid lines on top of it to help you line everything up. Um, I'm one of those people who I really like everything to be nice and neat and organized, like exactly the margins all matched and all of that. There are tools to do that in PowerPoint, but a great way to just visually see, like, is panel A and panel B lined up correctly is to add these grid lines in PowerPoint. Um, and we'll just show, like, the gray grid on top of it while you're designing. You can just toggle it on and off, and it won't be on the poster when you actually print it. It's just the designing phase. Uh, but having this sort of grid structure makes it really easy for people to move from one part to the next in your poster. So thinking of it as sort of a grid in terms of how the data is organized will help make that easy to go from one part to the next. Margins. Talked about white space earlier. We're going to talk about it again because it's so important. There must be white space on your poster. You have to have margins around the edges of all of your sections, the edges of the poster, uh, between all of the sections. You need to have extra white space. It's going to look weird. It's going to look like you're wasting space. But if you don't have enough margins on your poster, it just looks like a wall of text, and it is overwhelming. Um, for I think almost all of you said you've been to in-person poster presentations. You've seen those posters where it's just a lot of text and no space to like sit and think about it. Um, so make sure that there is about 30% of your poster is blank space. Um, so that's also good news, too. When you're designing it, you don't have to think about 30% of your poster. It's going to be blank space. Um, yeah, so we suggest about 40 to 50 percent your graphics, so images, summary schematics, the actual pictures from your data. 20 to 30 percent is the text, so the figure legends, the bullet point list of text about stuff, and then 30 percent is fully blank space. And what does this look like? So in this sort of example poster layout, the blue bar on top, that's for your title and your affiliation, so you have a logo up there. The bottom bar, um, use it to visually separate. Some people will put like their references and acknowledgements in the bottom bar. So that's another place to put it as well as in that bottom blue bar. Um, the white rectangle, that's where all of your data and your information should go. Everything that is gray on this layout, do not touch. This is no go. Do not put anything in that gray space. Um, those are all no compete zones, aka don't put any information in the gray spots so that you keep those clean margins and can see what separates one section from the next. 
Um, this is especially important in your data section when you're talking about your different pieces of data. If you have two figures bumping up next to each other, people can't tell like what figure legend goes with which pieces of data. Um, and so it can be confusing trying to understand what pieces go with which titles unless you have that clear separation of white space. This is another slight variation of the four column layout I showed you. Um, so some pieces of data need just a giant space to show like one big figure. This is a great layout for that. A lot of genomic based projects use layouts that are similar to this. Um, so you have your introduction and methods and hypothesis and all that on the left column. You have your main figure of data in that middle top section. Um, and because it's larger, you know it's more important. So your eyes are going to be drawn to that first. Um, and then maybe you have smaller pieces of data in the rectangle beneath it. Um, maybe a different kind of experiment that doesn't need as much space. Then on the right side, you have your, uh, your conclusions, talking about what you found, summarizing it all, future directions, all of those other parts. Um, so there is a little bit of flexibility in terms of how you shape it. So even with this slightly modified version, everything is on a grid system. It's all in rectangles, and there's all white space between each chunk of the poster. So another important thing to think about is uh, what we call hierarchy in the typography. Uh, it's just fancy ways of saying that big words are important, small words are less important. So when you have a really important point you want to make, it is much bigger font than it is beneath it. Your title is absolutely massive on your poster. Section headings, larger fonts. If you have bullet points of individual information, that's a smaller font. Um, and you can tell what is important purely based on the size of the font that you're using. You can also do it based on position. So if you see here like a bullet point that is indented, you know that's a less important thought than the first bullet point to over to the left. Um, so you can indent things, move them in slightly different places to make them pop out more visually or to show that it's sort of like a sub idea underneath a bigger idea. Um, you can use color as well. Always be careful with color on posters, however. Um, keep in mind colorblind attendees as well. Uh, about 10% of the population is red, green, colorblind. So we highly discourage people from using red and green together on the same poster. There's a whole bunch of other color combinations you can use. Uh, like red and magenta is one. Um, you'll see blue and yellow a lot. Uh, there are plenty of other combinations. Just be careful not to include red and green together, especially when the color would be part of sort of like looking at different data sets. Like on one graph, if you have red and green, also make like one symbol a triangle and one symbol a circle. So that even if they are the red green colors, there's something else that people can see that separates them visually. Uh, so yeah, always be careful of color. Try to keep it simple. Don't use red and green together on the same poster. Um, so another example as well of like what the sections would look like on here. So in this layout, we have the poster title up at the top. We have NAH logo down in the bottom right corner. Um, and in this example, that has introduction at the top, the goal slash hypothesis in the middle of the left column, uh, methods down at the bottom left, big old chunk of data in the middle. Uh, so this is another place where they sort of merge two columns into one. So you have one giant data field. So more room for data on the top right corner and then conclusions underneath that. Um, again, these are just a couple different examples so that if your data fits best in a different layout that's not a pure four columns next to each other, you do have a, a couple different options to play with. Um, but if you're overwhelmed with options, there's too much to think about, go with the standard three or four columns that you see on posters. It's a tried and true. Everyone knows what three or four columns means. They know how to navigate it. Um, it's just the simplest way to go through a poster layout. Fonts, again, keep it simple. Um, highly recommend using sans serif fonts. So these are simple ones like Helvetica, Arial, Calibri. Um, these fonts that don't have the extra like flares on the sides of them, um, those are simpler and easier to read on posters. You can use serif typefaces like Times New Roman, uh, but most commonly now in posters, almost everyone is going to be using sans serif fonts. Um, do not use fancy decorative fonts. Just don't do it. People will not take your poster seriously if it is in Comic Sans. Do not do it. I have seen it. Don't do it. Um, so keep it simple. Pick one font for your whole poster and stick to it in something simple like Arial or Helvetica. Is it a boring font? Yes. Does it get your ideas and your science across efficiently? Also, yes. Um, so keep the font simple so that the science shines for you. So here's what I mean by absolutely massive titles. Um, I put these in the actual font sizes. 
Um, on PowerPoint, it's going to look weird, but if you're printing this out on a physical poster, your title needs to be in 80-point font. Um, and then the different section headings and secondary headings underneath that, it gets smaller and smaller as you go down that hierarchy of ideas. Um, also, I'll be sending the PowerPoint slides to all of you after this as well as the recording, so you will have this for reference after. Um, these particular font sizes are also on the OSE website. We have uh, a website that has our recommendations for creating a poster, um, and all of that is up there as well. Like I said, one font. So pick one font for your whole poster and stick with it. Um, that way people don't get distracted by fonts changing halfway through um, or like labels that look slightly different than the rest of it. Just keep it all the same font. Um, you can distinguish big ideas from small ideas by how big the font is. You can make certain things bold. You can make certain things underlined, especially in like an introduction and background. I'm a big fan of bolding or underlining the certain key words or key phrases in that. So again, if people have just a few seconds to run past your poster, they can find those bolded words and be like, oh, okay, metastasis is important in this poster. I'll stop by and look at this one later. Um, don't, uh, when you're moving characters around, don't play with stretching or rotating the font. There's all sorts of settings for cramming letters together or spacing them out more. Don't mess with those. Just keep it as a standard font setting. Um, if you're running out of space on your poster and need to find ways to squeeze it in, trim words instead. It is better to do that than to cram your font together to the point that you can't read it easily. Um, and wherever possible, again, use bullet points. Bullet points are absolutely your friend. Color. Keep color simple as well. Um, color really needs to serve a purpose on a poster. You don't want to put po the color on there just for fun. Color really helps differentiate different sections, different ideas, um, and it really sets the mood for your poster. Uh, so the most common sort of color scheme you'll see is dark text on a white background, just plain black text, white background, maybe some color accents around the title block um, and around section headings. So you want to keep it simple. Um, if you do include a color, like on the background, so you want to make your whole background like a light blue color, you can do that, um, but make sure you use solid colors, not gradients, because gradients will look weird when you print them. You cannot guarantee that it'll be all uniform, um, and it's also just harder to visually see quickly. So only solid colors, don't use gradients, uh, don't use pattern fills anywhere. Um, and definitely do not use photos in the background of your poster. Um, this, some people will do this where they take like you know a cool science image and then reduce the transparency so you have sort of like this cool image in the background. Um, it looks nice in theory, but in reality, it looks super cluttered when you do that because now there's too many visual elements that are not your actual data getting in the way. Um, you can't have white space if the entire background is a photo. So examples of what to do and what not to do. Top left is great. It's just a simple block of color at the top, block of color at the bottom. You can have colorful fonts for the headings. Then everything else is black text on a white background. Looks boring, but I promise when you print it, it will be a lot easier to read um, and people will be able to scan this quickly and get the information they need. Don't make this background like a solid color, um, especially if it's a very vibrant color. So the yellow and the reds are blocked out here because these are very like sort of jarring colors to look at. Um, if you saw a bright yellow poster, you'd be like, oh, that's so yellow. And you'd be distracted by the yellow instead of looking at what science they're actually talking about. Um, and again, don't use pictures in the background like the bottom right there. Um, looks cool in theory on the poster, but it doesn't let you sort of visually separate the different sections of the poster well enough. When adding images to a PowerPoint, um, do everything you can to make sure you have the highest quality photo so that it looks nice and crisp and you don't get a fuzzy picture. This often happens when you're putting in a lower resolution picture um, instead of a higher resolution one. Um, and this may take some playing around with the different files you have um, especially for people who are doing like immunofluorescence and you have these big photos that you know, they, come, like, they can get very blurry very quickly if they're not saved in the right format. Um, if you have an option of the kind of file to save it in, my favorite is always TIFF. So save as a TIFF file, that will scale the best. Um, TIFFs are also the largest file size, so it just physically takes up more space to use a TIFF than the other ones, but it will look prettier. Um, so if your computer can handle it, if the printer can handle it, use TIFF images. Um, if not, then a PNG is the next one that scales the best. Um, it's a little bit lower quality. JPEGs are the worst. 
avoid JPEGs at all costs. I've had so many problems with JPEGs either looking blurry or the color values themselves change from how it looks on your computer screen to how it looks on the poster. Um, so just don't do JPEGs if you can help it, any other file format. Um, also, be careful of images you find on the internet, um, especially if you're like borrowing a schematic from a published paper. You can absolutely do that. Make sure you cite them on the poster, but also make sure that you're downloading a high quality figure uh, that you're using. If you try to just like screenshot it off of the website um, or just download the first image you find, it may be a really low resolution image and look blurry on the final poster. Um, be careful of the proportions of your images. Don't stretch them, like make it longer or make it taller than it would be otherwise. Keep those rectangular proportions the same as what it is on its own. Um, otherwise, it's just going to look funky. You just want all the pictures to look like their normal proportions. Um, and posters are big when you print them. Um, I often will test out what like one corner of the poster will look like if I have one figure I'm worried about. Um, if you're designing this in PowerPoint, you actually can tell it to print um, at full scale and then flip through all of the different pages it would be printing because um, it will sort of tile it on a normal printer. So it will be like, okay, here's 10 pieces of paper this way and six pieces of paper this way. Find whatever number piece of paper the diagram you're interested in is and print just that page and see what the resolution looks like on normal paper. Um, so that's a good way to test out images that may give you problems um, if you don't print them first just to check them. Logos. Um, same thing with your scientific figures. Logos really need to be treated carefully, otherwise they will be blurry. Don't stretch them, don't distort them, or it won't look like the original logo. Um, vector art is your best friend here. If you can find a vector version of it, that will be the easiest way to get it onto the poster um, and not have it look blurry or look distorted. Um, again, talk to your lab mates. I can almost guarantee you somebody has a vector version of an NIH logo somewhere in your lab that you can copy paste and put onto your poster. Um, use a single color logo as well. There are often like colorful versions of them, but if you can find just a simple black and white logo, that's your best bet. Um, and you can put like a black or white logo on top of like a colorful bar um, and it will still stand out well. So like with a navy blue bar at the top, find a solid white logo and put that in the corner or something like that. Um, so going back to a poster that I showed you at the very beginning, now that we've talked about a lot of these design concepts, I wanted to show you just what it looks like when I take the poster from the original version and cleaned it up a bit according to some of these best poster practices. So this is the first poster I showed. Um, in reality, this is a lot. I put a lot of information to this poster. Um, definitely too much for a single poster. I tried to cram in too many projects at once, and it is definitely overwhelming when you look at it. Um, I also used, you'll notice here, there's a gradient, both in the title and the background. Um, now that I've done enough posters, I would not do that. Use the same color background. Um, so for fun, I went back into the poster a few years after I actually presented it, and I simplified it. So with our poster design concepts we talked about here, where do you see this different in the second one? Mm -hmm. All of my paragraphs turn into bullet points, yes. There's a lot more white space, absolutely. Anyone on chat as well? Ooh, also, thanks, Alexis, for putting a colorblind checker into the chat. Um, I'll include that in the follow-up email, uh, but there's online tools to check for colorblind compatibility. Um, I didn't change the heat map at the top just because I ran out of time, but I did change red green to red magenta in a few places on here as well. Um, let's see. Yep, I also got rid of the full abstract. So in the first version, I had that full abstract copy pasted in the top left. Too many words. So I changed that to bullet points. Um, I reduced the amount of text overall, um, especially the figure legends. I went in and took out a lot of the nitty gritty science details that nobody cares about, like antibody concentration. Nobody's going to care about that at your poster. Um, if they want to know, they can talk to me and I'll tell them the antibody concentration. Uh, added a bunch of white space so that you can separate the sections. Um, I added little distinct borders around them. Um, you don't necessarily have to have little borders, but I find that it does help to separate the sections as well, just having a thin line around each chunk. Um, and I also removed some data from this because I knew I had too much data on the poster. Um, so like I mentioned before, you don't have to tell every single thing you did. It's better to tell a complete story and have less information on there. Um, we're running close on time, but the last couple tips for you. 
the actual poster presentation itself. Um, remember that your paper poster is not the full story. A big part of communicating your science is how you tell it to other people. So you want to be organized in your thoughts and be succinct in your thoughts when explaining it to people. Um, and you're able to tell people what you did clearly and importantly, enthusiastically. Um, you want to be excited about your science. Like some of the best posters I've like been to, poster presentations, are people who are just genuinely excited about what they're doing and want to talk to me about their science. It may be in a field I know nothing about, but if they're excited about it, I'm going to be excited about that work. Um, and remember again, you're telling a story. So if you're having problems thinking about like how to walk through it, um, you start with, uh, here's the big picture of my project. Here's why we care, cancer bad. Then you work down into smaller ideas. So work uh, like what methods you're gonna be trying. What are your goals for this project? Talking about your data. And then ending again with the big conclusion statement, um, having your happily ever after on your poster. Um, and really thinking like talking people through a story of why you did what you did, what you found and what it all means in the big picture. Um, so again, when you're presenting, um, be prepared, practice with your lab mates, practice with your PI, practice with people who know nothing about your work if you have time. Um, I highly recommend meeting up with other postdocs who are in a totally different IT or a totally different scientific background and just practice your posters with each other and see if their poster presentations make sense to you and vice versa. Um, always remember again to put the audience first. So if you have someone coming up to your poster and talking to you and asking questions, um, you are absolutely allowed to ask them what their scientific background is. Um, and once they tell you, you'll have a better idea of how much of the background information they'll already know. Um, you can't guarantee it, but you have a better idea of how familiar they are with your field um, and how many like technical details to go into. Um, another thing here, so when you're walking people through your poster, I typically try to have a like three to five minute version of walking people all the way through. Um, this may seem super short for the amount of stuff on your poster, and it is. Uh, but it's good to have about that five minutes planned out, especially for big poster sessions where often judges have to get to four, five, six posters in an hour. Um, so they would love to stick around and talk to you for 20 minutes. They do not have time to sit or stick around and talk for 20 minutes. They may only have five minutes top. Um, so practice being able to walk through your entire poster with someone start to finish in about three to five minutes. Um, sometimes you will have people who want to talk longer. Awesome then you can expand and go into whatever details they want to talk about. Um, but sort of start from that three to five minutes practice one, um, and then you can shorten things or expand things if you need to based on the person you're talking to. Also listen carefully um, or read carefully questions that any poster judges or attendees give you. Um, when they ask a question, it's very important to make sure you're answering the right question. Um, if you only sort of half listen and jump into an answer that's not answering their question, um, it's not communicating your science well. It's not getting to the questions that they really want to know. Um, so pay attention to the questions they're actually asking. Um, another really, really important one, it's okay to say when you don't know something. And in fact, it is better to say, to admit that you don't know something than to make up an answer that is not real. Um, I still do this. And like when I get presentations, I will admit, like I, I don't know what uh, you know, this protein means or what the next steps are. So it is fully okay to admit when you don't know something. Um, so real quick, in conclusion, some of the common mistakes we see in posters, um, too much stuff. This is the biggest one by far, is just too much stuff on a poster. Too much text, too many pictures, not enough white space. Um, by simply making sure you have white space between your sections and having a good block layout, that's gonna fix the vast majority of problems that we see in posters. Um, you also don't really want block text longer than 10 sentences. Any more than that, your eyes will start to blur. So minimizing text, maximize white space. Do not wait until the last minute to prepare the poster, especially with several hundred people needing to print a physical poster. Um, so make sure you get this done early. Talk to your lab about what poster printers you have available. There are poster printers on the NAH campus. Uh, most ICs have their own. Um, so we'll just depend on what IC you're in, but there are printers available on campus. Um, practice that like two to five minute, three to five minute oral presentation of talking through your poster with people. Be comfortable with sort of the spiel that you give to people every time they come up to you. Um, and it's also a problem to not practice. So just practice, practice, practice. Very important.
my final tips for you, um, again, tell a story. It is much more interesting to listen to someone telling you a story about what they do than to hear them go on and on about a particular method that they did. Um, people like following stories. It's why, you know, we love podcasts so much and why we love TV shows so much. They're telling us a story within an hour. Um, do the same thing with your science. It will engage people and will get them excited about what you do. Know your audience. So know what sort of scientific background they're coming from. Um, know how to talk about the jargon or avoid the jargon if you need to. Um, less is more. So remember the white space. Remember you don't have to include everything. Leave space for your posters to breathe. And that way you remember to breathe as well. Um, and finally, have fun. These poster sessions, they can seem overwhelming. There's a lot of people all together, but they're also a genuinely fun time to really show off all of the amazing things you've done. Um, one other important thing for the post back poster day as well, um, especially for people who just started, your poster doesn't have to have a full story. So don't feel panicked, feeling like you don't have enough information to fill out a poster, um, that you won't be able to fill it out. One of the best posters I saw at post back poster day last year was someone who started in January and presented her poster in May and had zero data, absolutely zero. The whole poster was the, basically the design of the project of here's the problem our lab is looking at, here's how I'm going to do it. And it was all about the future methods and the design of the experiment without having any data. And she was so good at presenting it. It was concise, it hit all of the points, it had a big picture, it had a story that I cared about. Um, so you don't need to have multiple years of data to have a great poster. You just have to have a story that you can talk about well and get people excited. Last but not least, uh, just leaving up the OAT website and our YouTube page. We have a ton of other resources on there related to presenting um, and other scientific skills. And the link as well to the OAT poster guideline for the post back poster day. Um, and that's a good standard spot to use for posters for other places. So again, read the directions for that event. Um, but yeah, so all of that is there. Um, thank you for coming and I'll take any questions if you have any. People in the chat as well, um, feel free to put your questions in there. Uh, if you're in the room, also gonna have you uh, run to this microphone in the corner so people online can hear you. And if you need to go, that is A-OK. -okay. I was going to ask, I had like two questions. So the first one is, um, uh, is this recorded? I unfortunately got here late. Coming from yes, we are recording this. Um, so I will email this out to everyone afterwards. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, you said the oral report's like two to five minutes. So mm -hmm. from my understanding, because I didn't see what, how it went, how this presentation went down last year. Like we have our poster, we present in front of like a group of probably this many people, it's a super full. And so we're only talking for two to five minutes, and that's it? Per person, yeah. So what a, um, have you been to a poster session in person before? Uh, yeah, I thought they were like 15 minutes long each person. I thought that's how... Uh, yeah, so you're probably thinking of like, um, like actual like scientific talks with a PowerPoint. That's more common. I'm going to back it up all the way to the beginning here. Um, so I'll show you a picture of what a poster presentation looks like. There we go. So a typical poster day, you're going to have just boards lined up along the hallways so people with their individual posters tacked up. And it's just sort of a free roaming, people wandering in and out. Um, so people will stop um, and look at your poster. It, often people will just scan the title and maybe your introduction in the span of maybe 15 to 30 seconds and then move on to the next one. Some people will want to stop and talk, um, but because there's so many posters all at the same time, most people really can only stop to talk to you for two to five minutes at a time. Um, so having that short sort of summary of your poster to walk people through is a great place to start. And then if they want to stay and talk longer, you can absolutely build out on that and add more details to it. Uh, but remember that most people want to talk to you for a short period of time and then move on to the next poster. So we're not presenting in front of a crowd with our so, own time. Okay. So yeah, you will not be presenting in front of a crowd. It will be just whoever wanders up to your poster. That's, that's the two to five minute over presentation. Exactly. So you may be giving that same two to five minutes over and over and over. You may do it five or six times in a row, uh, but be prepared to only give it to just a couple of people at a time. Mm -hmm. you. Pass the mic to the back there. Um, 
So I was at the uh, NHGRI symposium, um, and I think there were judges for that poster session. I wasn't here in the beginning, but are there judges for this poster session, and how would it look like? Mm -hmm. Is it anonymous? Um, yeah, so we do have judges at Post Back Poster Day. Um, I believe everyone gets two judges, maybe three, probably two, because there's so many people. Um, they will have a, like a comment sheet and be like writing down stuff about your poster. They will give feedback on it, um, and you will get those comments back at the end. Um, so you will get a little bit of feedback from them. Um, I believe, remember correctly, um, Alexis, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but how we do it is like the top 20% of posters will get like an acknowledgement for like being in that top 20%. Um, so yeah, you, you want to be in that top 20% if you can. Um, regardless, we try to get you feedback on your poster. Um, and for judging, is there a rubric or do you know what would be like the criteria for the poster? Yeah, that is a great question as well. Um, I will ask uh, Alexis and Natasha if we can send that out. Um, but essentially, it's all of the points we talked about here. So is your poster easy to read and easy to understand? Um, were you good at walking through your project and explaining the science in the way that the judge can understand? Um, did you have good uh, methods? Like, were all of your scientific controls well-designed? Um, were the methods well-designed? Uh, were your conclusions fitting with the data you actually found? Like, did what you conclude make sense for all of your data? Um, and then I think there's a section just for, like, how well do you talk about the science? So, like, how comfortable was it to talk to you? How well did you answer questions? Um, it's really more about, like, the presentation aspect of it. Um, and that's where just practicing with other people will come in huge handy there. Um, if you practice a few times, you'll feel a lot more comfortable, and you'll be able to answer questions more comfortably as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they're trying to do, uh, Alexis says they're trying to do three judges per poster. So everyone will try to get three judges. Um, ooh, it's a good question. Someone says, if your project is about a disease with a long name, would you have to spell out the whole name in the title? Um, yes. Unfortunately, I think you probably should spell out the disease name in the title because no one will recognize the acronym unless they like specifically know that disease. Um, you can then abbreviate it in your introduction section, uh, but in the title, you probably do need to spell out the whole thing. Uh, someone asked, if you don't have results, can you still be considered in the top 20%? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you don't have results, but you present your story really, really well, like the one poster I saw last year, yeah, absolutely. You could still score in the top 20%. Um, it's all about how well can you tell your story, not about how much data do you have. Um, and Alexa says, we will share the rubric either by email or on the website. So yes, the rubric will be up before post back post today. Um, and all posters are considered. Great. Anything else? I wish you all the best with designing your posters. If you have any questions along the way, just reach out to us. We're happy to help. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing all of your posters at post back post today. Thank you.